And the Oscar goes to. From Inter Eternity sets out to speak some harsh truths about the military, but is more successful in giving us an always entertaining and fascinating group of core characters played perfectly by four principal actors. The movie was based on the 1951 novel of the same name by James Jones, a World War II veteran turned novelist, probably best known for his 1962 novel The Thin Red Line, which was adapted to film in 1964 and 1998. From Here to Eternity, Jones' first published novel, was loosely taken from the author's time in Company E, also known as the Boxing Company, a union in the pre-war Hawaiian division's 27th Infantry. Though at least one person has said, the characters and the novel's events and awful conditions were made up. Whether true or not, harsh conditions and very controversial subject matters were plentiful in the book. There was explicit language, prostitutes, mentions of gonorrhea, crooked army leaders being rewarded instead of punished through the course of the story, graphically described scenes of physical abuse at the hands of a stockade leader, and possible sexual abuse by said leader. One of the biggest sticking points was the inclusion of homosexuals. Jones was actually pushed to remove some gay sex scenes before publication. In other words, the content of the book, not to mention its 800 plus page length made many in 1950s Hollywood rightfully believe the book was unfilmable. Nonetheless, Harry Cohn, co-founder of Columbia Pictures and its president and production director for many decades, snatched up the film rights for $82,000 in a deal known as Cohn's Folly. From Here to Eternity follows Private Robert E. Lee Pruitt, played by Montgomery Clift, as he joins a rifle company stationed in Hawaii in 1941. Pruitt is a career soldier and skilled bugler, but his new commanding officer, Captain Donna Dynamite Holmes, played by Philip Ober, is interested in only one thing, Pruitt's prowess as a boxer. Unfortunately for Holmes, Pruitt quit boxing over a year ago. Maybe you heard about what happened with Dixie Wells? You mean that fellow that got hurt? Yes, sir. Yes, I heard about that. It's too bad. I can understand how you feel, but those things happen. That's why I decided I would quit, sir. You might as well say stop war because one man got killed. Our fighting program is the best morale builder we have. I've got a mighty sour company bugler. How'd you like the job? Not if it means fighting. Looks to me as if you're trying to acquire a reputation as a lone wolf, Pruitt. You should know that in the Army, it's not the individual that counts. Well, you'll find that we won't put any pressure on you in my outfit. Just don't make any mistakes in it, that's all. To make the young private change his mind, the selfish crooked home sets out to make Pruitt's time in the company a living hell. Pruitt's company punishment is doubled up, and he receives unfair treatment from the other officers. Pruitt's only true friend in all this is the optimistic and carefree Private Angelo Maggio, played by Frank Sinatra, who doesn't get along with the dangerous, deranged, and violent Staff Sergeant James R. Fatso Judson, second in command of the Stock K, played by Ernest Borgnine. And no, Sinatra didn't get his part in the movie because of the mob. His then-wife Ava Gardner put in a good word for him with Harry Cohn, and he was also a dirt cheap to hire at the time. Maggio takes Pruitt to the new Congress Club, a gentleman's club where Pruitt falls with nightclub hostess Lorene, played by Donna Reed. Meanwhile, Holmes' right-hand man, First Sergeant Milton Warden, played by Burt Lancaster, begins having an affair with the captain's wife Karen, played by Deborah Kerr. Karen and Holmes are in a mutually unhappy marriage where both cheat on the other, but Warden and Karen still must keep the relationship a secret from the captain and the other officers. Screenwriter Daniel Teradash lessened or eliminated altogether many of the novel's controversial material, like all references to homosexuality, the novel's foul language, and some of the not-so-nice things said or implied about the military. This satisfied the production code office and the U.S. military, which allowed the production to shoot on location at the Scofield Barracks in Hawaii, use aircrafts, and obtain Pearl Harbor military footage. In some cases, these changes are okay. In others, it hurts the story and went against what the novel and director Fred Zinnemann were going for. The movie would certainly pack more of a brutal punch if we at least saw some of Judson's abusive behavior towards military prisoners. We can get by, though, with seeing the aftermath and only hearing about the actual violent acts. It helps that Borgnine is effectively intimidating and threatening. Even though his early career was represented by him playing heavies, not having seen those movies, I don't usually think of Borgnine as frightening, but the sociopathic abuser he plays in this is almost terrifying. What does hurt matters is the requirement in old Hollywood to punish the evildoer. First thing I learned in the army was that an officer takes care of his men. Seems to be the first thing that you forgot. 
My only regret is that we have to keep you in uniform until a court-martial is concluded. As someone who wants to live in a just world, I'll admit it was satisfying seeing bad people punished, but that's not always how things work, sadly. Showing that such injustice can happen, even in the military, is always important to show as it helps keep people aware of it, which in turn can help prevent and protect the organization from such corruption in some cases. Sanitizing it to show the military as this always morally just organization goes against unfortunate real-world realities and is just plain dangerous line to make the military look good. So the military measures has been watered down to a large degree, is less effective as a result, and seems to go against the intentions of the book the film is adapting. The military stuff isn't even given that much screen time, really. There was some stuff about Pruitt being an individual in an environment that doesn't welcome it, but I don't see that developed in any kind of satisfying or notable way. I'm not saying the military angle doesn't work at all. Heck, it's still shocking today to see characters like the captain so obviously corrupt, not to mention uncaring when it comes to those he commands. And seeing Judge Hudson wield his power to inflict so much harm on those he dislikes is frightening and it makes me want to fight against such injustices in real life. But our four lead stars are where the film truly shines. All four play lost, some are broken people searching for a new path in life. They all look for it in different places. First off, we have Pruitt. I love the army. But sure doesn't love you. If man loves a thing, that don't mean it's gotta love him back. Yeah, but a person can stand just so much. You love a thing, you gotta be grateful. See, I left home when I was 17. Both my folks was dead, and I didn't belong no place until I entered the army. Lorraine left her hometown in Oregon to come to Hawaii after her well-to-do boyfriend of three years suddenly left her for someone else. Now she hopes to use her job at the new Congress Club to her advantage. Another year, I'll have enough money saved. Then I'm gonna go back to my hometown in Oregon and I'm gonna build a house for my mother and myself. And join the country club and take up golf. Then I'll meet the proper man with a proper position. I'll make a proper wife who can run a proper home and raise proper children. And I'll be happy because when you're proper, you're safe. Warren wants to be out of under the nose of the captain and he's looking to transfer. I'm getting sick and tired watching you being a stooge for homes. Yeah, well, you ain't gonna see it much longer. I'm getting sick and tired of it myself. I'm through, Pete, any day now, and I mean it. Ha-ha! <laughs> Listen, if Holmes had let me, I'd transfer out of here tomorrow. As half a dozen companies in this regiment had grabbed me, and in grade, too. Karen gives him another option that would give him what he wants. Miserable in her marriage and thinking her relationship with Warden would bring her happiness, her option for Warden may give her what she wants, too. You've got to become an officer. You can take the new extension course, the one they passed last May. When you get your commission, they ship you back to the States. An officer? Yes. Then I could divorce Dana and marry you. It's fascinating to watch these four stories play out. I haven't enjoyed watching a set of characters this much in a long while, and I seriously enjoyed every minute I spent with them. They may seem two-dimensional and cliched at first, but they quickly reveal themselves to be deep and complex, especially Warden. Obviously, Teradash deserves some credit for his great script, but most of the credit has to be given to this damn fine cast who hit these roles out of the park. I particularly enjoyed Clifton Lancaster, whose relationship continues to develop throughout the movie and helps both their stories and characters to progress. They can both with ease be serious, funny, and tragic all in the same scene, which shows the complexity of human emotion and situations from moment to moment. Like in this scene, where the two talk after having a few too many drinks. This girl, see, she wants me to become... Become what? We're an officer. Can you see me as an officer? Yeah, yeah, I can see you as an officer. You'd be a good officer. We both can see more than I can see. I don't want to be an officer. I'm happy where I am. I might turn out to be a guy like Holmes. You wouldn't want me to be a guy like Holmes, would you? Huh? Or would you? <laughs> a man should be what he can do. Clifton is one of the few method actors we've had in this series so far, and this approach to acting, as well as the way the film was shot with his use of locations and slightly imperfect sound like the waves on the beach and echoing barracks, heralds in a new era of filmmaking with the help of the next two films in this series, On the Waterfront and Marty, which both get away from the studio-bound films of old and take different approaches than the classic Hollywood films that came before them. 
Zen Men, who directed 1952's High Noon and future Best Picture winner Man Fall Seasons, intentionally resisted shooting the film in color or the widescreen format that was becoming more common among film studios looking to compete with the ever-growing popularity of television. Until 2011's The Artist, this decision would make From Here to Eternity the last Best Picture shot solely in the 4-3, otherwise known as 1-3-3-1 aspect ratio, that had been the Hollywood standard for decades. I say shot solely in that aspect ratio because... Well, we'll get to that when we talk about it on the waterfront. For Zinman, the choice was purely an artistic one. He felt shooting the film in color would take away from the grittiness of the story. I agree. Color, or at least the bright in-your-face technicolor of the time, combined with white screen would have given the movie a glossy, epic feel that would have taken away from the rough, personal, intimate stories being told. This movie is a joy to watch. The public critics in the Academy must have thought so too, since it was the second highest grossing film of the year, was held in reviews, and was nominated for 13 Oscars, winning eight. A record at the time tied only by Gone with the Wind 14 years earlier. Both films coincidentally featured actor George Reeves, better known today, and in 1953 as Superman, the popular 50s TV show, in supporting parts, which in the case of From Here to Eternity was not cut down because of preview audiences recognizing him as the Man of Steel, contrary to the popular myth. From Here to Eternity Eternity's brilliance is derived partially from its daring post-war comments about the military, but more so from what it has to say about people, excellently played by a troupe of skilled actors. If you haven't seen it yet, I implore that you do. You'll come away remembering it from there to eternity.